And as we were looking at peace, we were looking at peace in terms of the fruit of the Spirit that we obtain within ourselves. How is it that we find personal peace through Christ? Um, there, is, there is a lot of, of multifacetedness to peace. And really, one of the things that we see in the Bible is that peace isn't just limited to, uh, to us, but as was pointed out by Jennifer, peace is something that, that we're called to be in terms of the world. We're called to be peacemakers. Uh, and it seems like that's a very difficult thing to do in today's day and age and, and, and in today's world. I mean, uh, you almost can't even say good morning to somebody without it being offensive in some way, right? How are you? Oh, what is that supposed to mean? Am I doing bad? Or, you know, I mean, it just feels like it feels like we're always on the sense of being outraged or upset or angry. And then when it comes to real issues, you know, we just absolutely can't agree on anything. Uh, and, and even to a degree, uh, this is something... Uh, as far as I can tell, this isn't something that really came about in terms of like 2000. You know, I, a lot of people say, well, really around the turn of the century, we really started to become more and more divided. If you go back and you look, we have gone through periods in our country of extreme divisiveness and then times where it's sort of like just bubbled down a little bit. It seems to be okay, but it's never gone away. Divisiveness and, and turbulence in our lives and in our world is something that has always existed. And so how do we as Christians deal with that? And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. I don't have a ton of slides today. What I really wanted to do is I wanted to just kind of like wet the appetite or get the ball rolling. And then I want to let you all do the majority of the discussion today, because I think that's, I think that's important because this is something that affects us uh, so real in the here and now that it's something that we should probably uh, discuss. And so I thought that was a good idea. And uh, I've got a few things, a uh, few slides, and then uh, we, we can open things up for discussion. I guess, for my thinking, the, the first thing that I was wanting to know is what does the Bible say about peace and about being a peacemaker? Of course, we know Galatians 5.22, or, you know, blessed are, are, are the, or, that's Matthew, I'm sorry, that's Matthew 5, 5, 9. We have, we have Galatians 5.22 that says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And so, uh, Peace is something that we're supposed to have as a fruit of the spirit, but we know that peace with within our within our world, or at least within the immediate worldview, is is possible within ourselves, since we're told by Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight through twenty nine, "Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest." And so again this personal idea that we can ourselves have peace and that we can't really find peace until we find it through Christ. I mean, you can have moments in your life of, of happiness. You can have moments in your life of where, where things seem to be calmed down. You can have moments in your life where, 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 where everything feels like it's okay, but that won't last forever. Happiness relies on A, B, C, D, E, and F all lining up. And when one of those things gets taken away, and now all of a sudden your world gets thrown into chaos, peace, you know, you know, relies on all these, you know, environmental factors that we just simply can't control. And Jesus is saying the real means to real peace is through me. I'll give it to you. I'll give you rest. And Paul tells us in Philippians four seven that it is peace that surpasses all understanding. Again, it's not that it's not that it's 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 like wow, I just don't understand where this came from. It's it surpasses all understanding in a sense that there is nothing else in this world that, with my knowing that I am saved in Christ, that I'm loved, that I'm appreciated, I'm accepted, I'm affirmed. That's what everybody wants in life, right? We want to be appreciated. We want to feel like 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 our like we matter, that we've meant something, that that what we do means something. We want to be uh, accepted. You know, nobody wants to be an outcast. Nobody wants to feel like they're sitting on the outside looking in. And we want to be affirmed. And Jesus does all of those things and through the cross. And he says, and I'll give you the peace in your life that circumstances can't touch. You know, yes, you're going to have problems. Yes, you're going to have issues. Yes, they're, yes, the world is going to hate you. But you know, take heart, I've overcome the world. And of course, it's a fruit of the Spirit. Now, we as Christians are told that in the way that we interact with the world, that we must try to, as much as it depends on us, live peaceably with all people. There's grace built into that word or built into that verse. You know, you have to live peaceably with all people as much as it depends on you. Now, that doesn't mean that, that you know, you know, when it says as much as it depends on me, that when somebody honks and makes a rude hand gesture at me in the traffic circle, I'm like, well, that's it. Done everything I can do. And then I hop out of my car and I pummel them. Right. No, I mean, that's not necessarily what that means. In fact, it's not what that means. What it means is that in the world that we live, 
we have to try. We have to go out of our way. We have to be uh, peacemakers. We have to live peaceably. Now, when it says, as much as it depends on you, that's where the grace is built into this. Because sometimes, regardless of what you do, or how you live, or how you act, people will not appreciate you. They will not accept what you're saying. They will find contention. And so, there is an element to this which is out of our control. I can, I can live as a Christian, I can, I can try to be as godly as possible, but I cannot control the actions of people. If people decide they're going to hate me because I'm a Christian, they're going to hate me because I take pro-life stances, they're going to hate me because I don't uh, support the LGBTQ. I think there's a two in there now. I, I don't understand where the two came from. I, I mean, I really don't. I'm not mocking that either. I, I really don't. Um, just because I don't support that, you know, people, people aren't going to just accept me for that and say, oh, well, it's okay to each their own. They're going to say you're a bigot, you're sexist, you're a homophobe, you're, you're this, you're that, you, you're, you're, you're one of the worst people in society, you're what's wrong with everything. You know, and, and despite your best effort of living as a Christian, you'll face these kind of things. So as much as it is possible within me, I have to be the source of peace. Despite the fact that some people are just not going to accept that or be okay with that, that doesn't mean that you know that you know it, it, I can I can just jump into a physical altercation if somebody doesn't like me or, or, or you know clearly too there's a sense in which we have a, a right or a duty to defend our family. Someone breaks into your house and they have ill intentions, you have a right to defend them. But what Paul's talking about here, he's talking to a church in Rome that was under unbelievable amounts of persecution. And, and we can talk a little bit more about that here. Nero uh, persecuted the church in Rome to the point that he it, it, allegedly, it, it still hasn't really even been proven yet, that Nero was the cause of the fire in Rome. A great fire swept through Rome. And what did Nero do? You know it's those Christians' faults, right? You, you know they're the ones that did it, that extreme ideology. When you, uh, there's a, a, a little book called um, The Letters of Pliny the Younger. And he was a governor during the time of Emperor Trajan, I believe. And he actually wrote in, in, I mean, this book is full of all kinds of letters. If you like history in any way, shape, or form, this book is for you. And in this book, he's writing uh, all these different letters to different people. But there's a letter to the Emperor Trajan in this book about what do I do with Christians? I have Christians in my, in my province, and they don't seem to do anything wrong. I mean, they, they come together on Sunday mornings. They, they partake of a, he called it a sacrament. Uh, he said they, they, they sing songs. He said they have these messages about how they should be peaceful people, about how they should not steal or cause violence. Um, and, and you would think he's building a case as to why they shouldn't be persecuted. Then he says, but what, what should I do when I arrest them for this? You know, should I, should I try them? Should I execute them? Uh, we have pamphlets cir circulating all throughout the province to trying to identify. And he sends this letter off to the emperor. And the emperor basically writes back and he says, no, you're doing just fine like you are. He said, don't change anything. He said, don't, don't use pamphlets necessarily. He said, but, but what you need to do is you need to give these people an opportunity to come in before you. Uh, they, need to, they, they need to repent of their Christianity they need to burn incense to Caesar. And if they do that, they're free to go. No problem. If they won't, you give them a warning. And then if they still won't, you execute them. So persecution of Christians in Rome was, was a very real thing. And that's why Paul, it seems so interesting that Paul is writing to a society that, that is just not just oppressing Christians or persecuting Christians, but it is is doing everything they can to eradicate them. And he's saying, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. He's not saying take up arms and rise up and fight. He's not saying get in their faces. He's not saying dissent. He's saying you be like Christ. And that's, that's hard to think about sometimes because what they would do with Christians was so cruel. They would take them and they would starve these lions and then they would put Christians in the arena and they would fill it up with people and they would just let the lions loose. Other times what they would do is they would burn people at the stake. Um, there's, a, there's a story about a, an elder in the church around 86 AD. His name is, um, oh, his name is leaving me now. Um, I don't remember what his name is, uh, but it's in the volumes of the early church fathers. Um, I had it on the tip of my tongue a second ago. But what they did with this man was they, 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 they did that exact thing. They took him. Uh, before the assembly in Rome and they said, hey, you are an elder in the church. You're one of the leaders. We're going to kill you and make a public example of you. And he said, he said, I, 
I don't deny that at all. And they said, if you repent of your Christianity, though, we'll let you go. And it won't be a problem. And he wouldn't do it. They warned him two, three times. And, and, and then they started threatening him with how he was going to die. We won't just execute you. We will burn you alive. He wouldn't do it. And the last words he uttered, they, they literally took him and they put him on the stake. And, and, and set fire around him and, and we're getting ready to burn him. And they said, this is it. This is your last chance. They really, 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 really wanted a leader in the church to denounce Christ. I mean, how, how else can you just do a sucker punch right to the gut of these people that you hate that live in your city? And he said, I have been alive on this earth 86 years and Jesus Christ has never forsaken me. So why should I forsake him now? And they burned him alive. So persecution was a very, very real thing. Nero would take the bodies of Christians and use them to light their, you know, the garden parties. You know, I mean, homosexuality was rampant. All these things are rampant. And what's amazing about this, you would think that this sounds terrible, that it sounds awful, and, and it really is. But Christianity didn't just survive. It thrived despite this. The church grew at such an incredible rate. The more they tamped down, the more they pushed, the more Christians reached out. There's something to be said about what Paul says where he says, as much as it depends on you to live peaceably with all people, because the crazier they get, the harder they push, the more like Christ you are, the, shider, the, the, the brighter you shine. Now, Jesus says you are a lamp or a light on a hill you, you know, that, that the world can see. And nothing, nothing shines brighter in those moments of insanity than when you continue to stand firm and act like Christ. And that, that's a very important thing. Um, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, he tells us that once we become a Christian, we have a whole new purpose to our lives. We live for Christ, and in living for Christ, we must be at peace within ourselves and live lives that seek that peace. And the way you know that you're living a life like that, and you're trying to be a peacemaker that Christ has called you to be, is that you'll be persecuted. I mean, when you look at, at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he's not listing eight different qualities for eight different people. He's saying these are the qualities of a Christian. These are the qualities of one of my disciples. And when he gets down to verse 9, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These are linked for a reason. If you're a peacemaker, if you're living for Christ, you're going to face persecution. Paul even says it himself. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it comes with the territory. Now, as bad as things are in our country, in our society today, we're still not facing persecution like this. Now, I don't know that any one of us in this room will ever be thrown in jail for our Christianity. Uh, Ten years ago, I'd have said, eh, probably not. Today, I'm like, eh, maybe, you know. I don't know if it'll happen. I don't know if it won't happen. But I know that, that no matter what level of persecution we face, we still are called to live uh, at peace as much as it is possible within us. Now, Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 39, Jesus also said, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile with him, go two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And then in verses 43 through 46, you have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust for if you love those who love you what reward do you have do not even tax collectors do the same <sighs> tax collectors he's going to compare you to a tax collector if you're otherwise that's kind of a that's kind of a come on you're not like you're not like that right <laughs> now the world and the culture we find ourselves in today We've never really in human history been so connected. I mean, social media, the, all, these, all these online platforms we have, we have never been more connected. And at the same time, we've never been more isolated. We've never been more divided, at least not in our lifetimes that I've seen or, or probably that you have seen either. And every topic that's out there becomes a point of contention and division. So when, when a major issue does come up, we just murder each other over it, literally. I remember a few years ago, I was on, I was reading this, this post. It was, it was from a science website. It said in the year 2036, 
an asteroid has a one in 10 million chance. And they named the asteroid. It's about the size of a New York City block. It says it has, it has a one in 10 million chance of, of impacting the Earth. But the whole underlining premise of the article was, A, this probably isn't going to happen. B, even if it does, we've got technology that we can take care of this long before it gets here. And I'm thinking, oh, this is a, this is a good positive article. And right down in the comments below was, well, you can thank Donald Trump for that. What? And, and then the comment under that was, well, you can thank whack job liberals for that. And it's like the whole thing just devolved into this, like beating each other up. And, and I'm sitting there going, this is a, this is a science article about an asteroid. And we've, we've turned it into this fight. It's, it's everywhere. And it seems to be that that happens on every front now. And it, and it feels like it, it, not only can you not get away from it, but it's oppressing and pushing down on you and invading every circle of your life. Many only want to hear the viewpoints of people within their own echo chambers, and anyone outside of that purview is a terrible, awful person. And we have to get rid of you, we have to cancel you, we have to fire you, we have to silence you, we have to do whatever we can to get you away or, or get you out. Because we, we, we can't have a dissenting point of view that isn't what the mainstream feels or agrees on. Uh, you have to be exposed. It's, it seems like it's everywhere, and it seems like it's happening all the time. And even, even most of your newspapers that, that are, are on one side of the political aisle or the other are all agreeing that we're living in an in a anger incubator. Right? It's, it's all the time. It's constant. And, and, and you can never turn it off. And that's the thing about it. Social media, it's not that social media is necessarily an evil in and of itself. But if you think about social media, 40 years ago, you didn't have social media. You didn't know uh, what Jimmy Carter's viewpoints were 24-7 in 1977, did you? That's probably closer to 50 years now. I, math is not my strong suit. <laughs> but... But, you know, you didn't, you didn't have constant, you know, here's the CEO of this company constantly pounding their, their political and their social views in your face. It's not that these things didn't exist then. It's just now they're in your face 24-7. There's no reprieve, right? And, and the other side of the coin, too, is it, it's something, I mean, think about what social media did for this, or for this congregation during COVID. Every single one of us were able to attend services basically because it was recorded. I mean... Social media has a lot of good aspects, but the negative aspects are that we are constantly being subjected to, to a, a bombardment of opinions and, and personalities and, uh, and just doctrine that's constantly being shoved in our faces, and we just can't get away from it. And sometimes turning it off is the best thing you can do. When we were at camp, I couldn't access my phone at all. Like, uh, there was, there's one spot in the camp. If you go around this corner and you're standing in the field, and when you're out there in the dark and all the senior boys are heading to the pool and they don't see you standing there and they just happen upon you in the dark standing there, it freaks people out. But there's this one spot where I could go to check my email. And when I did, I was like, why am I doing this? Why do I need this? What, what is there going on in the world right now that's more important than what's going on here? Because I'm with Christians, I'm with brethren, I'm with friends. I'm, I'm closer to heaven here than I am being out there in the world checking my phone. So what am I doing? And, you know, obviously that's not possible to always turn that off. We're connected through work, we're connected through school, we're connected through all these things. But, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying that that's what anybody should do. But to me, it was probably one of the best weeks of my life just because I couldn't access that stuff or think about that. Um, and anger and violence, they're constantly being stewed up. And, and the thought of living a life of peace or being a person of peace in today's day and age, it seems almost laughable. Yet the Bible continually tells us that we need peace for our souls, our brethren need peace, our families need peace, and our communities need peace. It's very easy to look around the world and feel like you know we don't have any control, or even worse, uh, to be roped into that angry thinking ourselves. You know, and it's happened to me. I, you know, I've let the news get to me where I get mad and I'm, and I'm fuming and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, why am I mad about this? Can I control this? Can I change it? Is there anything I can do about it? No, I'm just sitting here mad. Is that really what God wants for me? You know, and I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about anybody else. My wife is the cool head in our house. So typically she's the one that's like, you're being an idiot. Stop it. You know, but, um, these things, she doesn't actually say that to me, by the way. <laughs> But the Bible tells us that the fruit, the attributes, the qualities of being children of God are that we want, we strive for, we long for, and we seek to make peace in the world. And there are very real and tangible ways that we can be people of peace. One way is to look at Christ. And the question is, was Christ a peacemaker or was he a peacekeeper? 
What do you think the difference between peacemaker and peacekeeper is? Some people say, no, nope, I'm just trying to keep the peace around here. You know, and what, and what they're saying really is, I'm not going to take a firm stand one way or the other. What I'm simply trying to do is just be as agreeable and out of the way as I possibly can so as not to contribute to the problem. To be a peacemaker, though, is a little bit different. If I'm reconciled to God and I wish to emulate God and model his character, I have to be a peacemaker, not always a peacekeeper. Peace, peacemaking begins, uh, or excuse me, peacekeeping begins with our relationship to God, that he has brought peace to our lives through the gospel. Jesus uh, has brought peace and made it possible because he died on the cross. And Peter says, if you have tasted that, uh, and tasted that the Lord is good. And what the point of this is, is once we've tasted that he's good, we have to model what he is in the world. We have to be like him. Romans 5.1, again, Paul writing to Romans, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus was only a peacekeeper, he would have complied. He would have kept the status quo. He would have been quiet. He would have, he, he would have been regarded very highly. People would have loved him. You know, it's easy to be a peace a peacekeeper in that sense, and and to be a peacekeeper would have just been to said, look, you guys, you Jews have done it all this way, all this time. It's fine. You can you can say what you want. You can do what you want. You can live however you want. You can be whatever you want, and 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 it's all okay. But he didn't do that. The devil even tried to offer him this. You remember in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, he took him up on that high mountain. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, I will give you all of these as far as the eye can see if you bow down and worship me. What, has, what always boggled my mind about that verse is that that was a temptation to Jesus. It's, you know, and, and it, it doesn't say that it was just something he was subjected to and he did it or, or, or didn't do it. It says he was tempted by it. Now, I'm not tempted by, by power like that. I'm, I would guess you're not tempted by power like that. But if you think about who he was and what he wanted, he wants the soul of every single person on the face of the earth, living uh, past, present, and future to be saved. And what the devil was saying is, I'll give you that without the cross. I'll give you that without you having to do anything, without you having to go and confront the whole reason that there is division between people and God in the first place. And if you bow down and worship me, I'll make you the king that they want. I'll make you the Messiah they want. I'll give you what they want because when they realize you are not that, they're going to eat you alive. They will murder you. They will blaspheme you. They'll spit on you. Your, your, your own disciple. I mean, all the Jesus has to know this. So it has to be tempting in a sense. But of course, Jesus, just because something is tempting doesn't mean that he was on the verge of being like, oh man, I might do this. I might do this. And then at the last second pulls back. It just means it's something that, 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 that at the very least is appealing in that sense. I'm tempted. I was tempted last night at the Gilbert's house to eat a fourth fruit cup. Now, was I tempted? Yes, I was very much. Did I do it? Yes, I did. <laughs> I failed. But it wasn't, like it, it, it wasn't like it was gnawing at my soul or it wasn't like it was something that I couldn't get out of my mind. Temptation can be like that. But it doesn't say that that was like this. This was shoved in front of his face by the devil because the devil knows what he wants. The devil knows who we are. And yet Jesus resisted that. Jesus, Jesus to be a peacemaker, would have said, okay, I'll, I'll take your deal. But a peacekeeper, or excuse me, to be a peacekeeper, he would have just taken the devil's deal. To be a peacemaker, Jesus had to go through the cross. Yet, he didn't shy away from sin. He didn't shy away from Satan. He confronted it head on. And because he did, we're free. And so to a degree, we have to do the same thing. Now, does that mean that in the world, we have to pick fights? Does that mean that we're always looking to be disagreeable? You ever met people that like to pick fights? I have. I've met Christians that like to pick fights. I've met Christians that like to be disagreeable. I've met Christians that, that are quick to name the truth of what's going on in somebody's life, but be so unkind and so unloving about it. You know you're going to go to hell for doing that, right? Oh, we just met this person. What do you do? I, I mean, I mean, these are rare people, but but I, I have known people like this. Um, and again, as was brought up last week by many of you, there, there, there was a there was a a lovingness to the way Jesus was a peacemaker, the way he made peace. The woman in John eight. I mean, he could have easily said, "Yeah, absolutely. She's an adulterous stoner." But, you know, there's problems there, right? Where's the adulterer? Because it takes two to commit adultery. You know, there, there's, there, there's lovingness there. Hey, you know what? She's not perfect and neither are you. you know, we all need grace sometimes. We all need mercy. We all need forgiveness. The woman at the well in John 4. I mean, we've talked about this before. Why do you go to the well in the middle of the day, in the middle of the desert, right? 
it said that this woman had seven husbands. And so she's avoiding all the other women that are going to this well in the morning by going in the afternoon when no one's there because she's probably burned a lot of these women. And Jesus probably could have called her out and said, you're a horrible, adulterous woman. How terrible you are. But no, he doesn't do that. He confronts her, but he does it in a loving way. Now, she could have spit in his face. She could have thrown rocks at him. She could have attacked him. But as much as it depended on him, he was the peacemaker. He didn't have to pick a fight. He didn't have to be disagreeable. He didn't have to tell her how she was going to hell for what she was doing. He, he approached her in a loving way. I think love is the key to all this. It doesn't mean, again, that people are going to reciprocate that. But... Um, it also means that despite being aware of the issues, we're looking for common ground with people. And this can be hard to find. Um, real actions can show people uh, how that we love them. And again, we don't accept sin as okay. We don't compromise and we don't just sweep things under the rug. We're looking for common ground to stand on. It used to be that common ground was a front porch. You remember those... There, People talk so fondly about it. Oh, we'd gather on the front porch and we would talk and we'd have conversations. You know, we could leave our doors unlocked back in those days. Neighbors would come over. I actually grew up in a time where if I did something wrong, and this and this is me, uh, where if I did something wrong and, and one of my friend's moms knew about it, they would call my mom. So my mom would know when I got home, hey, you went to this you were in this part of the neighborhood when we told you that you're not allowed to cross that street. How did you know? And of course, you know, my mom's not going to tell me that Miss Wendy, you know, my friend Cameron's mom called. She's just, I have eyes everywhere. I thought she was a superpower or something like that, you know, or superhero. But, you know, we don't have this anymore. This is where we used to have our conversations. This is where we used to find common ground. This is where we could even disagree. And it's, it's gone. We just don't live in an era where Mayberry in, in places like that exist anymore. They once did. They were real. But yet, at the same time, even though we can never go back to that again in our lifetimes, we're being forced to find new ways to find common ground with people, to, to stand in a place where we can feel comfortable, where we can let our guard down, understanding that not everyone can be reached or will want to find peace, again, as much as that depends on you, but a place where we can be honest, where we can talk to people. That, and, and that's becoming increasingly harder to do, a place where we can foster real conversation. And... Where we can try to be a peacemaker is in the lives of people who are striving for it. There are polls out there from Gallup, from Pew, from all these different places where people are recognizing that we are divided racially, we're divided culturally, we're divided politically, and yet most Americans don't think that this is either a good thing or it's sustainable. That alone is positive because it means that there are people out there that are willing to find common ground. There are people out there that are willing to be agreeable. There are people out there that are at least willing to look around and say, we can't go on like this. And it opens up a door for us as Christians and just as people who want that ourselves. There's a book uh, I read a few years ago written by a man named Sam Kiones. It's called Dreamland. Has anybody heard of this book? Now, in this, in this book, he's dealing with the opioid ep epidemic in America, and, and, but it has, it has direct connections to what's going on here. Because what he's saying is, why, why is it? He said it used to be the, in the 1960s and the 1970s if you wanted you know, heroin, or in the 1980s if you wanted cocaine, or if you wanted a hard drug, he said you'd have to be involved in a network somewhere in a big city, or you'd have to have connections where they could get that stuff to you. He said, why is it now that black tar heroin is killing kids in Huntington, West Virginia, or these little small towns in America? America. He said, well, you know, what, what's going on with that? Now, this guy is, 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 is not a conservative necessarily by any stretch. He's certainly not a religious person, and he doesn't, uh, you know, present this book, but he's seeking to answer this question. What's happening in our society that's causing this breakdown where this is happening? And he, he comes down on three things. He says, number one, he said, you have the disintegration of the family. He said the, the family is under attack. We don't have this 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 structure anymore, uh, and so because of that, he said because you know I can't grow up with a father figure. He said I'm going out and I'm seeking a father figure elsewhere, right? or I don't have a mother figure. I'm going out and I'm seeking a mother you know a motherly figure elsewhere. And a lot of times for for kids and families in these broken situations, they're not turning to good places. He says there's the deterioration of community, the disappearance of the church. He says these are three things going on just in these small communities, he says, and, and they're falling apart. He says everything is falling apart, and that's why he said you're seeing drugs and things being funneled in so easily. You can really relate that to so many other things that are going on. The disintegration of the family, the deterioration of community, the disappearance of church. And, 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 and I'm not even talking about the church. I'm talking about just, just even denominationalism is just disappearing. And at least it gave people a sense of morality. It gave people a sense of right and wrong. It gave people a sense of let's stand here and talk this out or let's find common ground. It's gone, right? And, and, and of course, what he really says is that the family and the church 
are all part of the community. He said the community just is gone now. He said we want to be left alone. We want to be isolated. We want to we you know we want to have our our bubbles and our groups, but they're all cloud based and not necessarily on the ground based here. Uh, and and when he talks about the disappearance of the church, he's not even approaching it from a from a religious standpoint. He's approaching it from a secular standpoint. He's saying as an institution, it was good and it was good for this, but because it's gone, it's leading to the destruction of the community. As, you know, as a family environment, because the family is disintegrating, it's taking away from community. He's saying we lost community, and that's the whole part of it. We've lost community. He's absolutely right. The church is a community of like-minded believers, of people who all share the same thing in common, the blood of Christ, and we're called to be peacemakers. And for me, the realization that it's not our job to mandate peace, it's not our job to manipulate peace or force it or, 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 or demand it, it's our responsibility to seek it. It takes a lot of pressure off of us without feeling like I have to be a peacemaker and everybody has to agree or everybody has to believe or everybody has, because it's not going to happen. Jesus Christ himself performed miracles and raised the dead, turned water to wine. He, he brought Lazarus out of a tomb after he'd been dead for four days and they still hung him on a cross. It's not going to be possible for us to, to reach every single person or be a peacemaker to every single person but it's possible for us to try and it's possible for us to live like that. So last, last few points here, and then uh, I'll open it up to you all. Uh, peace that we have from God has to exist in our own lives. Uh, we try to live at peace with others and we'll find that it's often not always possible. Much of what we do, despite clear biblical precedence is really beyond our control. And, and, and that's true. A lot of things are beyond our control. Uh, while we do not go looking for conflict, we stand up for truth when we must. And no matter what happens in our lives, we trust in God to take care of us.